Consider the following linear transformation, T from R4 to R4. T is defined on the vector V as A times V, where A is the real four by four matrix given as follows. The question, find all non-trivial subspaces of R4 that are invariant under T. Now, let's recall what we mean by invariant under a linear transformation. So, we have a subspace W in R4, we'll call it invariant under T. If whenever little w is in our subspace, we apply T to little w, we get back another vector in our subspace. So, invariant just means T is gonna carry your subspace back into itself. Now, by trivial, I mean the subspace zero and R4. So we're always gonna have those as invariant subspaces. Now, that means we're looking for subspaces in between these two. So they'll have dimensions one, two, or three. For dimension one, this is gonna be a familiar problem. We're just looking for eigenspaces. So the idea here, if we have a one-dimensional subspace that's invariant, I could write this subspace W as just a span of a non-zero vector. If it's invariant, that means A times W, okay, that has to lie back in our subspace. So that means it's just gonna be some multiple of W. So by definition, W is an eigenvector. Now, to find the eigenvectors, we just set up our characteristic polynomial, find the eigenvalues, and then if there are any, we can find eigenvectors. In this case, when you work out your characteristic polynomial, we get lambda squared plus one squared, and that has no real eigenvalues. So for this matrix, this linear transformation, we're not gonna have any invariant one-dimensional subspaces. Next, let's consider invariant subspaces of dimension three. Again, we'll have none. Let's see why that happens. So. Suppose we have an invariant subspace of dimension three. I'm gonna call it W. We restrict T to W. Then because W is invariant, vectors in W are just gonna get carried back to W under T. We choose a basis for W. So I'll call that V1, V2, and V3. That's gonna induce a linear transformation T prime from R3 to R3. That'll have an associated matrix M. So, we'll show that M must have a real eigenvalue, and that's gonna mean that A must also have a real eigenvalue. Because we actually computed the characteristic polynomial for A, that's gonna give us a contradiction. Now, if we compute the characteristic polynomial of M, well, we don't know what it is, but we do know that the lead term is gonna be lambda cubed. So by considering the N behavior, okay, as lambda goes off to the right, P sub M is gonna to go to plus infinity, so we go to the left, it goes to minus infinity. The intermediate value theorem says we're gonna have a zero somewhere. So M has at least one real zero. Now, I wanna show how that means A must also have a real zero. So if we take our basis, complete it to a basis of R4 by adjoining a V4, what happens? Well. We know with respect to the standard basis, T is gonna be represented by the matrix A. With respect to our new basis, it's gonna be represented by some matrix A2. And because these represent the same linear transformation, that means these matrices are similar. And the relation is by our basis matrix here. Now, you'll note for A2, okay, well, W's invariant. So V1 is gonna to go to a linear combination of V1 through V3. The coefficient of V4 is gonna be zero. So for this column, it's gonna end in a zero. It's similar for the second and third columns. For the fourth column, we won't have any information. Now, if we compute characteristic polynomial of A2, we note that P sub M is gonna to have to divide P sub A2. But since A2 and A are similar, they're equal. So that means P sub N divides P sub A, and since P sub M has a real root, P sub A must also have a real root. But we know that doesn't happen, so contradiction. 
Now, where we will find something is in dimension two. In this case, the invariant subspace is unique. So, how do we find an invariant plane? If we have eigenspaces, there are two things we can try. If I could find two linearly independent eigenvectors, we could take their span. Or, if we have a Jordan block of size greater than or equal to two, in the corresponding basis, we can find two vectors that'll span an invariant plane. Now, this is not our case since we have no eigenspaces. Another approach, we could look at null spaces corresponding to irreducible quadratic factors of the characteristic polynomial. So, the linear factors correspond to eigenspaces, the irreducible quadratic factors are going to correspond to invariant planes that include no invariant lines. Now, in our case, the characteristic polynomial is lambda squared plus one, quantity squared. So I would consider the null space for a squared plus i. So if we work that out, here's a squared plus i. Okay, we can row reduce. And then we know by inspection, we're gonna have as a basis for our null space, one, zero, one, zero, and zero, one, zero, one. So call those vectors v1 and v2. So the claim is, this is gonna be our invariant plane. So C invariant, we just check. If I apply a to v1, we get v2. So that's good, we're winding up back in w. If I take a of v2, we get minus v1. And again, we wind up back in w. So this plane is in fact invariant. Let's show that the invariant plane is unique. So, We'll assume that we have another invariant plane W prime with basis W1, W2. First, we show that W intersect W prime is zero. Now, the intersection of any two invariant subspaces is another invariant subspace. So the intersection of our planes is gonna be an invariant subspace of dimension zero, one, or two. The dimensions two then W equals W prime, that's not very interesting. The dimension's one, we have an invariant line, but we've already ruled that case out. So if they're not equal, the dimension's gonna be equal to zero, so that means the intersection equals zero. Let's take a look at what's happening on W prime. So if we restrict T to W prime, by the invariance property, W prime gets carried back to itself, so with our basis, that induces a linear transformation T double prime from R2 to itself, and that'll be given by some matrix M prime. Now, characteristic polynomial of M prime is gonna be a quadratic. Our previous argument shows that the characteristic polynomial of M prime divides the characteristic polynomial of A. Since A has only irreducible quadratic factors, that means the characteristic polynomial of M prime equals lambda squared plus one. Now, the minimal polynomial for M prime divides the characteristic polynomial, so it too has to be lambda squared plus one. So, M prime squared plus the identity matrix equals zero. To make use of M prime, we'll get a contradiction when we compute the minimal polynomial of A. So, Choose the following basis for R4. I'll V1, V2, W1, W2. With respect to that basis, T is represented by the matrix A sub three. So remember the way we interpret this, the columns tell us where each basis vector goes. So V1 goes to V2, V2 goes to minus V1, W1 and W2 are going to linear combinations of W1 and W2 determined by the columns of M prime. So that's how we get our matrix here. Now, if we take A sub three, square it, add the four by four identity, it's gonna give us zero. That'll follow because if we take M prime, square it, add the two by two identity, we get zero, which we just saw. Now, that means the minimal polynomial of A sub three is equal to lambda squared plus one, but because a sub three and a are similar, the minimal polynomial of a is also gonna be equal to lambda squared plus one. Now, 
we go back to the actual matrix for A, we could square that, add the identity, and then we know we're getting something that's clearly not equal to zero. In fact, if we take this matrix and square it, we're gonna get the zero that we're looking for. So that means the minimal polynomial of A is not equal to lambda squared plus one, and that's our contradiction. So our invariant plane is unique.